Hello dear friends. I would like to present you an interview with the eldest son Joachim von Ribbentrop. This interview is of interest not only because he was the son of a prominent statesman in the Third Reich, but also because he served in the Waffen-SS, having previously undergone some military and political training. Rudolf von Ribbentrop was not a general, but was a combat officer. Considering how many battles he went through while remaining alive, it means that, in addition to abnormal luck, he was well versed in the art of military affairs. And if we add to this the fact that he was a member of the highest circles of Germany and possessed certain information that was not known to the general public, then we get a very interesting interlocutor from a historical point of view. Do not forget to rate this work, as well as leave your opinion on this topic. Well, we are starting. How do you respond to the events of the 22nd of June 1941? The general situation was such that after all the Soviet Union was ready to attack Germany, the troops were deployed. Adolf Hitler hesitated because he feared that the Soviet Union and the Americans would attack him at the same time. In his situation, he thought that open attack would be better than covert hostility. This, in any case, was then the official version. Personally, I would like to leave the opportunity to ask what Stalin would have done if we had not attacked. If we evaluate the events of today, then it was the attack on the Soviet Union that eventually became the cause of the collapse of the Third Reich. What is it like to live in Germany with the surname von Ribbentrop? You cannot choose your fate, but it was hard, both before the war and after the war. A very impractical name. Since my father was Minister of Foreign Affairs, I felt it my duty to excel and be a good example. I will add that our whole family, in general, has always been pro-Russian. Grandfather kept saying that the biggest mistake of the Kaiser's empire was that it did not unite with Russia. My father pursued a policy of rapprochement with the Soviet Union. Alas. Unfortunately, it was stupid that Adolf Hitler attacked the Soviet Union. How did you add it to the environment? What was your attitude then to Adolf Hitler and the regime which were set to Germany then? I certainly had a positive attitude. My parents, my father, participated in this. Not in everything, of course. Parents, of course, criticized something. But in general, of course, there was a positive attitude. If we compare Germany in 1932, with 7 million unemployed and a huge number of communists, with 1939, when there was full employment, no unemployment, then everything in the country was good, and this was absolutely clear. But by no means can this be said about the entire era of Adolf Hitler's rule, which lasted for 12 whole years, that it was only good or only bad. Where did you see Adolf Hitler for the first time? When he first came to visit, in 1933. On the negotiations, which were dedicated to the formation of the government. My father was also supposed to take part, and he visited our house several times. What impression did he make on you? Of course, he was a great man, a great leader, he raised the economy. However, he personally did not make such a striking impression. The only thing that was special about him was his light blue glowing eyes. Otherwise, he gave the impression of an ordinary person. I mean, he certainly wasn't stupid. There must have been a personality change in him, that he suddenly got a talent for rhetoric. He, of course, paved his political path only through his speeches. Today they say it was meaningless cries, okay. But then there were 8 million unemployed, everything is depressing, and suddenly someone comes along who says that he knows how it should be. Just follow him. This, of course, bribed. He was an excellent orator, and his speeches, in which he often turned to shouting, made an impression. February 3, 1945. Berlin was already on fire, I was walking with my father down the Wilhelmstrasse to the Imperial Chancellery. My father wanted to know what happened after one of the raids, if he was alive and so on. And then my father suddenly said to me, what do you think? Goebbels inspired him to close the Geneva Commission, because if the soldiers knew that they had no protection, they would fight more boldly. I got angry and started yelling that this would lead to disaster and that there would be nothing left for the troops except how to go to self-destruction. The father said, yes, I am also of your opinion. We came to the imperial office, an adjutant approached us, I asked, father, is everything all right? He said, yes. 
Nothing happened to him. Will you come with me to him? I refused and said I would wait. The father did not understand this at all, he does not want a great leader. But I was so angry about this story. I slowly walked towards the huge square, and my father went to the office. Suddenly, a soldier from the Imperial Chancellery approached me across the square and said, I had to go to the bunker. This, of course, was to be regarded as an order. And so I stood in front of him. By this time I had not seen him for four or five years. Then you notice the difference much more clearly than when you see a person every day. I was shocked. It was an old man. One hand trembled, he held it all the time. Then he told me and my father, now there will be a turning point. Now there will be a turning point. Now a new regiment will be sent to the front every day. This is so unprofessional, incredibly unprofessional. Well, they don't create a new regiment every day. And they don't send him to the front. It was so unprofessional for me that I thought to myself, well, if you didn't know before that things were going wrong, now you do. He was asking about Weinstein. Then the economics minister Funk suddenly showed up and said, we don't have any more money. Then they just hit the imperial bank with a bomb. Then he said absolutely calmly, you know, Funk, at the moment it's not so important. He was completely out of touch with reality. That was the last time I saw him. How and what happened to the Jews in Germany? The whole Jewish question began only during the war, when the situation became tense. It is impossible to reduce all the events that took place in the Third Reich only to the Jewish question. Talleyrand's famous words fit here, it was worse than a crime, it was a mistake. But this whole phenomenon, everything that happened to Germany at that time, cannot be reduced only to the Jewish question. The results speak for themselves. In the big politics of our time there are no concepts of good or evil, in high spheres there is only right or wrong. Shows only the result. In the book you use the term, Berlin of my youth. What exactly is the Berlin of your youth? How would you describe it? About this, of course, I have to read a very long report. All political trends could be found in Berlin. From nationalists to communists. There was a very strong communist party, which, of course, grew very strongly when economic conditions deteriorated dramatically. In Germany there were 7 million unemployed and 8 to 9 million voters who voted for the communists. They were opposed by conservative circles who did not want Germany to become communist. There were very serious clashes in the streets. The emergence of Adolf Hitler and his movement came from two sources. Firstly, this is a very bad economic situation, which has developed not least because of the high indemnities imposed on Germany, but also because of the global economic crisis. And, of course, people's fear of communism. Which was then understood as communism, precisely of the Soviet persuasion. Thus Hitler actually came to power. Although he never had an absolute majority. It did not have an absolute majority. In addition, Berlin was a cultural center. There were also Munich and Hamburg, but the central point was Berlin. And every artist wanted to be recognized in Berlin. Question regarding the 1936 Olympiad. You were there. Is there something special that you remember especially well? It was a great mood. I especially remember the cavalry officer who injured his collarbone and, despite this, continued to compete in the tournament, until the very end. His name was Wangenheim. He did not return from the Russian camp. I was at the closing of the Olympiad. Leni Riefenstahl invented the design, when strong spotlights shine vertically upwards, it turns out, as if the dome of a cathedral is made of light. Then it was first used. And I think Hitler then shook hands with Jesse Owens. It was the world record holder in running, an African American. For you then was principle that he was an AFRO American? Well, it registered. Yes, then there was this stupid racial theory. It interfered a lot. Many say that before the war Berlin was a very Jewish city. Will you confirm this? In certain sectors. In the press, perhaps. Theater, cinema. There were not only Jews there, but the Jews had a strong influence there. At the end of the thirds you was attended to the Napola school. This is a boarding school of the high school for training leading staff of the party and the Waffen-SS. 
Can you tell how Napola differed from regular schools, what differences in the program? Yes, in 1937. There were 10 or 12 classes in total, of which two classes were humanistic, both in Greek. I studied in one of them. But there was hardly any difference in the curriculum. We were taught that blondes with blue eyes are Germans, they are real people. And we ourselves laughed at it all the time. Then I was a soldier in the Waffen SS, there was always a saying, blonde, blue eyes, stupid. This is what we said ourselves. Because all this, the racial theory, was too exaggerated, too forced and caused an opposite response. The psychological breakdown, the mental catastrophe after the First World War was very difficult. Do you know about the Treaty of Versailles? It was very humiliating, for the soldiers, for all Germans. And Adolf Hitler wanted to create a counterbalance to that, and created a racial theory, and that's where it comes from. Were there special ideological lessons? Did not have. Only in a military school during my training in the Waffen SS did I have one lesson a week, the so called worldview lesson. Were you teach to dance? Dancing? Yes. We danced. Not like ballet, of course, but real teaching. The partners were students from a girls' school nearby. We treated them with all respect. In the early 20s in Germany there was very many different youth organizations of all possible trends is it true that Adolf Hitler usurped all these movements and used them for his benefits? Yes, there were hundreds of small groups. Basically, they all brought up young people diligent, stubborn and physically healthy. And in the background of all this was the idea that someday we will become soldiers again, and we will need to defend ourselves. And, of course, Hitler used them. There were so-called migratory birds, they were long before me, even before the First World War. They advocated a healthy lifestyle, for the need to be healthy and strong to defend the fatherland, they had a patriotic component. The main German problem, this can be traced throughout German history, is Germany's central position in Europe. The West has always been afraid of a too strong Germany, and the East is the same way. The great mistake that the policy of the Kaiser is always blamed for, and my grandfather also always spoke about it, is that it was not possible to establish a lasting and firm relationship with Russia. Bismarck was very smart, he understood that we would never have friendly relations with the French, and therefore he wanted his hands to be untied. Prussia. You probably know that in the 19th century there were uprisings against the Russians in Poland, and Prussia then sent help to Russia. I grew up with this good attitude towards Russia. What was the difference of the Waffen SS officer school from the Wehrmacht officer school? A very good question. There was no difference. It was the usual military training. You just need to understand that the Waffen SS was the brainchild of Mr. Himmler, he wanted to have his own armed force. You must always understand that at the very top, there was one person, and below him other people who were constantly fighting for influence, all against all. It is known that Himmler attached great importance to occultism, mysticity did you heard or know this? We laughed at this. It was some kind of hocus pocus. We had so many things to do, we trained units, we fought, and all this mysticism was absolutely not important to us. And all the good commanders of the Waffen SS had a bad relationship with Himmler. Before the French campaign, two days before, my father had a birthday and I had the opportunity to meet Himmler in Berlin. He came to congratulate his father. I greeted him especially bravely at the entrance and asked that our entire course of the officer's school, all the officers, could take part in the French campaign, so that we would not be left in the officer's school. He replied that we all do what we are ordered. He was absolutely right. The next day, it was the 9th of May, Quite by accident I met the regimental adjutant. They stood in the same town in Westphalia not far from the school. We Ribbentrops are a bit stubborn when we want to achieve something. I went to this adjutant, he asked what I was doing here. I tell him, I want to go to war with you. He answered me that this was against Himmler's order, and that he should ask the regiment. Himmler was never a soldier. The First World War also passed by his age. And he could not adapt to this military soldier tone, manners, and this is very important in order to find a common language with the military. Just so you understand the internal relationship, 
Himmler couldn't give orders to the Waffen-SS because the Waffen-SS were subordinate to the army. Everyone imagines the Third Reich as a complex, balanced and well-organized complex, but in fact the Third Reich was the complete opposite of this. Each organization only went about its own business, which is amazing. Hitler could not bring all this to a finished form, he was worried about only one question, how to avoid conspiracies against himself. He always made his employees swear at each other. You might think that I am exaggerating a little, but in principle it was so. Huge forces were wasted on this while the war was going on. When did you enter officer school? In May 1940. On April 20, 1941, I was released from the officer's school. Became an officer. How was the graduation from the officer's school, were any special ceremonies organized? There were speeches, yes. Adolf Hitler's birthday was not particularly celebrated. For me it was much more important that I became an officer. I was also treated very unfairly, my commander told me this only after the war. In total, there were 300 or 400 officers in the school, and as my commander told me after the war, that I was the best among them all. But they could not announce this, since I was the son of a minister, they could not make me the best. My name has always been very impractical. After that you were assigned to the SS Division Nord, right? Yes. It was a punishment from Herr Himmler personally. Because it was a division that had not yet been formed, it did not exist at all. It was my punishment for asking to go to the front during the French campaign. I've been on the wrong side all the time. There was some hierarchy of Waffen SS divisions, which of them was better? No. Everyone thought his division was the best. But not our division, because it was not yet formed. Then you were delivered to the north. And which area? To Finland. To the very north. South of Murmansk. How did you learn about the beginning of the war with the Soviet Union? Yes, that's a good question. I have known for a long time, in fact, since the beginning of the year, that relations are getting worse and worse. Mainly because of the Balkans. Because there was an uprising against the Germans, and the Soviet Union actually supported it. And then Adolf Hitler made up his mind. We marched there, quite north of Kirkens, in Norway, entered Finland to the south, in the Rovaniemi area. And then it was already clear what would happen now. I then served as the commander of a motorcycle platoon, in a reconnaissance battalion. They went on the offensive around June 25th, I can't say for sure. We were already ready at our starting positions and knew what was about to begin. What was the main complexity of the war in the forest Indiana that area? Forest, nothing to see. The Russian troops were very well trained. They knew how to move in the forest. And we were urban, we had to first learn how to make our way through the forest. To the fast I know, your division had very big losses. Very big losses, yes. And then everything was reorganized. It was a very bad story. It was my personal punishment. You was hardly wounded in September. How did it happen? We attacked up such a hill, and from there Russian artillery fired at us. A very large fragment hit. Luckily it didn't get to the joint, I was very lucky. These shards, you know, they're very hot. This is very painful. I talk to the Finns and to the Russian and Germans. The Finns say the best warriors in the forest were them, then the Russians, and then the Germans. Do you agree with this? The Finnish army was great. They moved through the forest like at home. We weren't bad either. We learned very quickly. No, we weren't that bad. But the Russians won the war. So they were definitely the best. When was you released from the infirmary? In December 1941. I was in an infirmary in Germany for three months because my bone marrow was inflamed, this is a disgusting story. What happened next was pure coincidence. Prior to that, there were no tank units in the Waffen-SS. It was very strange, we were the elite, but we had no tanks. After I was discharged from the hospital, I was taken by the commander from the Leibstandard. In 1942 you was further studying in Germany. How was the training to be a tanker? Very intense. We were given very good training. 
We were taught how to handle communications, take cover, assess the situation, and command a tank. You, as a commander, could replace the driver or tank gunner. I could if I had to, but I was in command of a tank. I'll explain to you, the whole strength of the German tanks was in this fifth man who commanded the tank. It was very important, and it was hard for the gunner, to estimate the distance through the sight. He needed to say, the target is 800 meters. Although we always took a little more distance, then we could see the place where the projectile hit. Where was the school you studied in? First, Wilschleek, then, Zoken. Studied on the Panzer IV, first with a, cigarette butt. Then came tanks with long-barreled guns. The long gun had a much longer range and was easier to hit. Have you used a dial to show the direction? Yes, straight ahead it was 12 o'clock, left 11 o'clock. It was very practical. Commands were given to the gunner with their feet. I was sitting right behind him, and I really could show him with my foot, and he already knew what to do. Commands were given to the loader by voice. We had two types of shells, high explosive fragmentation and armor piercing. The loader could shout, and he heard it. The entire crew had access to intercom, except for the loader, but he heard everything. Did you talk to the driver on the internal radio? Yes, yes. And the worst thing is that I often had to keep a close eye on the movement, so that it would not get stuck anywhere. From above it was better to see, and he could be told how to bypass some obstacle. Did you keep the top hatch in the tower open or closed? Most of the time it was kept open. Because then, in case of need, it was possible to jump out. But if a very hot fight began, then I closed it. If I understand correctly, when you saw the target, first you should order the driver to stop, then order the loader to load. I said, stop, and he should have stopped immediately. This was very important, especially in Prokhorovka. Because they drove by, stopped and fired. The loader himself knew what we were firing at. Only if a tank suddenly appeared did I have to say, Panzergranate. Can you tell about the hierarchy in a tank crew? The commander, of course, was the most important. Then there was the gunner. The driver was very important. The driver, perhaps, was even more important than the gunner, because he was not supposed to get stuck. The loader was the youngest and most unskilled. All he had to do was take the projectile and put it in the cannon. His main task was the machine gun. Very many, and very, often there were delays. You too, as a commander, participated in the maintenance of the tank? No, I just stood by, and they reported to me what had been done. We were very sensitive to this, because the worst thing that could happen was when the tank got up. And if you have been knocked out, the tank track is known, you could do this, pull it back. Yes, of course, but one person could not do it. When the caterpillar was knocked down, it had to be quickly pulled back. We practiced this a lot, it was important in battle, it had to be done as quickly as possible. Do you carry a personal weapon? And what? I had some kind of pistol, but I never used it. Where was it used? Only if you were ahead, the tank was knocked out, and you need to fight your way back, then it is very important. What was the hardest in the service of a German tanker? Repair. All parts of the tank are very large and heavy. But did you never use a pistol in combat? Very rarely. Such situations were very rare. I had a very brave lieutenant in the company, he often stood in the tower in the hatch and fired a pistol. I shouted to him on the radio, disappear in the tank, you idiot. Can you talk about Paul Hauser as a commander? Paul Hauser participated in the First World War, was an officer of the general staff, then served in the Reichswehr, and in the 20s he was retired. And then he was engaged in military training in our divisions. He became famous when we were surrounded in Kharkov, two divisions. And he received an order to defend Kharkov to the last soldier. Then both divisions, of course, would have disappeared. And he, at his own peril and risk, gave the order to break out of the boiler. All the authorities received the following degrees of the Knight's Cross, only he did not receive anything. Although it was he who initiated the success near Kharkov, 
because he saved two divisions. He became famous for his saying, with orders, as with bombs. They fall to the rear and hit the innocent. With this phrase, he became famous. Did you receive a German cross in gold for Kharkiv? No, it was later. I first received the Knight's Cross. Does this order have a name? Fried Eggs. What is the relationship to this order? Well, it is. You received the Knight's Cross once for one feat. And for the German cross in gold, there was a rule of thumb, five times you must do the deed for which they gave the Iron Cross first class. They had a different principle, for the first, a new order was given for each event, and for the second, it was necessary to perform a series of actions. We received the Iron Cross once, and it was good. When did you receive the Iron Cross, second class? In the Western Campaign, in France. I received the Iron Cross of the first degree in 1943, after we again took Kharkov. And then for Prokhorovka the Knight's Cross. I received the German Cross in gold in Normandy. In addition, I have a badge in gold, it was given if you were wounded five times. Then I have a badge for a tank battle and a badge for a tank battle, 25, this means that I participated in a tank attack more than 25 times. And then I also have the Finnish Cross of Liberty. What did you get? I ran for several days through the forest with three or four fighters. Every time we ran into Russians, it was a company. Your opinion of Kurt Mayer as a tank commander? Panzermeyer was a phenomenon. Panzermeyer was what used to be called a hussar general. Surprisingly, he even smelled differently. Yes, yes, it was a phenomenon. Then he was surrounded, after Kharkov. Do you know what he did? He said, we will now drive at full speed right through the Russian defenses, right along the main street of the village. Right in the middle of the day. He said that they would shoot one tank or truck, but if we resolutely go all together, they will get scared, pull in their heads, and not shoot. And so it happened. The commander was outstanding, very brave. Another such was, Piper. But Piper was a completely different type. He looked, thought, examined the area, took everything into account. Very diligent. When you was a company commander, did you have someone who created your life conditions? There was one soldier who brought food, polished shoes, and so on. He got a couple of marks for it. What was your salary, how much money did you receive? It didn't bother me at all. It was transferred to some account in Germany, I had no idea how much. We didn't need money. Where should we spend them? We had some money in our pocket just in case. We played a lot for money, there was a crazy movement, crazy money. Losing, of course, was very bad. But that was rare. Did you receive parcel from home? Yes, they did. It all depended on how the mail worked, whether they could get through. My aunt, who lived in Turkey, my father's sister, she sent me this package every couple of months, there were 200 Turkish cigarettes and 5 bars of chocolate. I never smoked, I told the crew, look, cigarettes are for you, but I eat chocolate alone. It was very convenient. It was wonderful. It was such an oriental chocolate, a chocolate mixture, very tasty. It is known that the German army used stimulants, pervithin. Pervitin, yes. It was given when the forces completely ran out. In my opinion, it was given only with the permission of the chief physician of the division. But doctors always said that if it was taken incorrectly, then the pressure dropped, and one could die. I never accepted it. There was also a Shoka Cola. We loved her very much. A wonderful thing. But it was given only by order of the chief physician of the division. She was part of the so-called special tank equipment for extreme cases. One soldier pulled it out and ate it, it was discovered, and I, as a commander, had to punish him. I told him, look, you can choose. Or I will be your father, then you will get a slap in the face from me. Or I'll write to your father that his son has been sent to the tribunal for theft. What you choose? He replied, give me one. Otherwise, the tribunal broke his whole life. Of course, to judge for such nonsense is madness. Everything was very strict in Germany. You couldn't even touch the soldier. If for some reason an officer needed to touch a soldier, 
you had to tell him, now I will touch you, and he should answer, yes, please. Or, I don't want to. This rule was observed very strictly. Did you send anyone to the penal divisions? I put on three days of strict arrest. He was locked up somewhere, he received only dry bread and water, and that was the end of the matter. It was a good stimulus. And if you were punished, then for one year you didn't get a promotion. Everyone wanted a promotion. An unloved punishment was marching between companies. The companies were stationed in different places, and you, in full gear, with weapons, had to march between the companies all day. Many said that three days in a cell was better than that. Were there any other punishments? Well, if something was really bad, they were sent to the division headquarters and handed over to the tribunal. Were there any rewards other than orders if you did something good? Certainly. You could have gone on vacation. But they didn't really do it. You could have been promoted ahead of schedule, of course. Did you go on vacation? Yes. I always received the least vacation, so that they would not say that his father was a minister, and therefore he received a vacation. This was the problem. Do you understand? This was a big problem for me. I shouldn't have been given leave because they couldn't recognize me as the best. Many German soldiers say that officers often had a so-called throat illness, the desire to receive the Knight's Cross, which weared around the neck. How is it a problem? There was no problem. Of course, there were vain commanders who could send soldiers to their deaths in order to receive the Knight's Cross, and the personnel felt this. That they would have to carry out such an order. And it was very corrupting. For some commanders, this was obvious. But there were few of them, and it was not a big problem. Realistically it wasn't a problem. What benefits did you have a Knight's Cross? You could always ride first class for free. And in the sense of relationships with superior officers, then there was more authority, or was you better treated then? No. The position was this, you had to serve, whether you could or could not, whether you wanted to or not. All were the same. And there were those who enjoyed authority, although they did not have the Knight's Cross. And the old rule has always worked, if you are a commander, and you yourself went forward, then your subordinates did not leave you in difficult moments either. One American general once said, you have to break through every step, you need to cling to every step. This is absolutely correct. And if you didn't take care of yourself, didn't hide behind your back, then your subordinates knew it too. And then this issue with the sore throat did not arise at all. You just had to show that you are going ahead. Most importantly, you had to show that you do not take care of yourself, do not give yourself concessions. Do I understand correctly that this description, what you now said, is, in principle, the description of a good commander? Good commander, yes. He doesn't have to take care of himself. And his soldiers should have the feeling that he cares about them. And if that was the case, then they did everything for him. What is a good soldier? A very good question. The goal of our military training was to get the soldier to think with the commander. And so that the soldier then behaves accordingly in battle, so that he knows what we want and how we do it, so that he thinks in this sense together with the commander. That was where we oriented the soldiers. What other strengths of the German army can you name, except organization and individual training? A soldier who thinks with the officer. What else can you name? Well, I must also say that orders simply have to be followed. And that you need to be very careful if the order is not carried out. This was, of course, very important, because then the leadership could not rely on you, because they ordered, but something else happened. What about weaknesses? Russians frequently talk about chicken, predictive actions. Do you agree with this? To some extent, yes. Well, there were, of course, proven, fundamental methods by which they reacted to certain situations. Their presence was also a huge help for the commanders. We also had a lot of very young officers who had no experience of war at all. But everything depended on the situation, I had to act according to the situation, I had to say, the situation is like this, 
and I act like this and that. Then it was possible to move away from the exact execution of orders. And what is the Red Army, what were its strengths and weaknesses? Of course, I didn't know from the inside how it was in the Red Army, I saw it only as an enemy. The Red Army was stable on the defensive. On the offensive, they also knew how to act. True, they often led him without proper preparation. For example, the attack on Prokhorovka was not properly prepared. We had this rule, if you must advance, then you must conduct reconnaissance of the battlefield. Identify weak areas of enemy defenses. But General Rotmistrov did not do this. Otherwise, he would have known that there was a whole tank battalion in the rear. And there is nothing worse than advancing against dug-in or even just standing camouflage tanks, because then the tank on the defensive sees exactly where someone is moving from, and the attacker does not see anything. Of course, a very unpleasant surprise for us was how well the Red Army fought. This was a very big mistake of Hitler, what he thought would be like during the First World War. That if you hold out for three years, then Russia will not withstand the difficulties and fall apart. But it was very different. In the north, in Finland, where we attacked the Russian positions, it was cool, the way they defended themselves. Many days. It was very impressive. And in the battle near Prokhorovka, I commanded a company in a tank regiment. Were your repair services far far away? They were in the back and we didn't even know where they were. If the tank broke down, they took it away and repaired it. Did you use the railway? Yes, as a cover. Tanks were not sent for repairs along it. My company and I crossed the anti-tank ditch, we turned into a line and went on the attack. Seven tanks. On the twelfth we received one additional tank. As a result, four out of seven tanks were hit. One is random. Two tanks were damaged and two were completely destroyed. They stepped back from above. After Prokhorovka, did you return to Germany? Yes, I received leave, after which I was transferred to the Hitler Jugend Division, formed from parts of units from another division. Leibstandard, as a company commander. Later I became a battalion commander there. It was formed in France to repel a possible invasion. Did Adolf Hitler personally give you the Knight's Cross? No, no, I got it in Russia, near Belgorod. He put on a decent tunic, came to the headquarters of the division, reported. They told me, congratulations, and they hung the Knight's Cross. Where do you get a decent cult in the tank, there is oil everywhere. Yes yes. We had cars in the convoy, and every officer had such a chest there. For those who were lucky, there was a good jacket. Then these chests were cancelled, it was too much luxury. And yes, they were dirty all the time. The Russian tankers had a special tankist helmet. And German. At first we had such special berets with a rubber shock absorber, but they prevented us from hearing well. When someone yells, enemy tanks, outside the tank, you need to react very quickly. And, in the end, you need to hear something for entertainment. You get used to not hitting your head pretty quickly. In addition, when the tank moves quickly over rough terrain, then, of course, it shakes, but due to the fact that the tank has such a huge weight, it still shakes relatively not so much, not like in a passenger car. If you compare the Eastern and Western Front, what was different? Many say that on the Eastern Front they have stopped paying attention to aviation and looking up. Yes. It wasn't necessary. Of course, if something arrived, we looked. But the Air Force, at least in my personal experience, played a very small role. Russian aviation did not particularly interfere, in my opinion. But, sewing machines, you remember? Well, yes, good. Russian, sewing machines. You heard them, you woke up, you knew that a, sewing machine, had arrived. What is the difference between the Western and Eastern fronts? I would say so. On the Eastern front, with a good talented commander, it was possible to get out of even the most difficult situation, even from the encirclement. At the same time, the Russians had superiority in people. Whereas in the West they did it simply, if they met with resistance, they sent 500 bombers and ground everything into flour. Well, artillery. 
The American artillery was very troublesome. If we bring everything into one formula, then we can say that in the West there was material superiority, and in the East there was superiority in people. This was the empirical formula. What are you the most feared? Fall into the hands of the Russians, of course. Siberia is so far away. What made the biggest impression on you when you were in Russia? If more exactly, to Ukraine, to the Kharkov region. Space, breadth, scope. And when we went into the houses, the people were kind, friendly. Of course, when the invaders come with weapons, all over the world everyone tries to be friendly. Can you say something about the quality of the replenishment during the war? Was the new soldiers worse than the veterans? Has the quality of learning declined? Of course, they were not like the old hares who were already at war. Although among them there were always a couple of good soldiers who easily joined the team. So it wasn't a big problem. Of course, the quality of training also fell among the officers. A freshly baked lieutenant who had been a soldier for six months or nine months, then ended up in Russia, and looked around with very surprised eyes. And the commanders, of course, also became worse. Although we said that it is better to be a young commander in a high position than an old commander in a low position. But much, of course, depended on the person himself. I told you about Hauser, so he often said that he does not feel sorry for his old head if it rolls at his feet, and he will feel sorry for our young heads if we lose them because he gives the wrong order. Did you put infantry on tanks? The Russians did it. In principle, we did this only in extreme cases. Because the tank attracts so much fire to itself, so that all the infantrymen suffered a lot from this. Suppose you received an order and another infantry officer in the same rank is working near you. Who subjected to whom, you to him or he to you? It was always clear from the order. This has always been exactly what was ordered. We have always been focused on working together, it was necessary to agree, everything was very fluid. But, in principle, it was determined by order. Attempt on Adolf Hitler on July 20th, 1944. How did you discuss this? At the first moment, if you are a soldier and are sitting in a tank, or lying in a trench, or undergoing training, and at home someone is making some kind of revolution, then you really don't like it. Moreover, you do not know the reasons and details. You definitely don't want this. But when you start thinking about it, of course, after a while you realize that this was just the moment when everything could work out. I wrote in my book, looking back, it becomes a pity that this did not work out. But my own adjutant, when he read my book after the war, asked me how I could write such a thing. When you sacrifice your life, you don't want anything like that. But even today I can absolutely clearly say that I regret that it did not work out then. And, of course, after that, everyone will look at me like I'm a jerk. Yes, of course, this would also mean the death of my father, this is understandable. My father was not involved in the conspiracy. It was against his nature. Then political officers were introduced, right? Yes, that's exactly what happened. They were called leading officers, they played no role at all. They were simply appointed to this position, and nothing else happened to them. In some cases, they may have done something. In any case, they did nothing for us. Why are they in the elite divisions? It was just a farce. But it was a bad farce, in general, it had a very bad effect on the morale of the troops. How did you receive Russian propaganda? We haven't seen or heard from her that often. The loudspeaker on the planes or something was absolutely meaningless, it was perceived only as some kind of mumbling, blah blah blah. Ever since the First World War, during training, they were told how to deal with enemy propaganda. You were supposed to pick up a leaflet, write enemy propaganda, on it and turn it in. It was clearly prescribed. In the West, the British had radio channels where they addressed people by name, it made an impression. But in the end, this did not play a big role in the troops. When there were normal officers in the unit, the soldiers were immune to this. When did you feel that the war was ending, that it was lost? That the war is lost? When the Allied invasion succeeded. This was in July 1944. Then we began to think that, of course, we need some kind of equal peace, we need a peace treaty. 
And from home, I knew that my father wanted to try to do it, and even tried to do it. But Adolf Hitler was already mentally blocked, as it were, he could no longer move anywhere. Mr. Ribbentrop, were you were a party member in the end? I'm not sure. Because right after the Imperial Labor Agency, I became a soldier, and the soldiers were not party members. I know for sure that when I was a soldier, I was not in the party. So I, apparently, was not in the party at all. And after the war, during the denazification, I was defined as unaffected. This is the fifth group, in my opinion, was. The first group were really bad guys. There were five groups in total, my father, in my opinion, was in the fourth group, as a fellow traveler, or something like that. Of course, it must be said that this whole procedure was absolute stupidity, total madness. This whole procedure led to the fact that the word Persilschein appeared in German, evidence of washing powder. For example, my father was in the party. My father was a chemist, and as a young student, he grew up in the French zone, it was bad, very hard, then he got the right to enter the university and went to Gießen, it was not a French zone, and in February 1931 he joined the party. So, after that, he no longer had anything in common with the party, he studied as a chemist, then he was a soldier, then he was wounded in the northern sector, then he got to the Americans, he returned from the American camp with completely destroyed health, then his health slowly recovered, and he got into the process. And there it was necessary to prove that you, in fact, were a good person. It means that you are still a good person. It was necessary to prove that you helped someone, did not betray anyone, something like that. And in this process, people brought documents, oath assurances for proof. It was written there that Mr. Dr. So and so is known to me as a person who adheres to liberal views, who has always been good, who has always helped the elderly and all that. And with the help of such documents, a person had to prove that he was absolutely not guilty of anything. And these papers were called, Certificate of Washing Powder, because they were used for laundering. Persil is Henkel's laundry detergent. Certificate of Washing Powder, it was a very important document, I have a lot of them from my father. How strictly do the officers and soldiers observe regular clothes? Very bad. There was nothing in the war. If you've torn your jacket, it means it's torn. At some point in our divisions there was an order that we were forbidden to require observance of uniforms. But it was already clear. Did you button buttons to the last? We didn't have buttons. We had, as it was called in the German Wehrmacht, a dress in memory of Kaiser Wilhelm. It was invented in 1936, with a very high collar and strange cuffs, it looked absolutely idiotic. We were the only ones with camouflage, camouflage overalls and camouflage jackets. But it was introduced surprisingly late. Did you take, for example, trophy shoes or something warm? No. We didn't undress the dead. This may, of course, happen only in the most extreme cases. But usually we don't do that. Could the Waffen SS wear the clothes of the Wehrmacht? Well, there wasn't much of a difference, the clothes were just a little different, some details, the color was also normal, field gray. If there was a danger that you would be taken prisoner, then you tried to remove all specific things from yourself so that no one would understand that you were from the Waffen SS. Siberia is so far away. Do you have a tattoo? Yes, yes, blood group. This was also complete nonsense, because there are many more blood groups, and for many, its presence cost their lives. On May 8, 1945, you taken it as a relief that the war is finally ended, or not? No, not a relief. It was a defeat. On the other hand, there was also a feeling that you no longer need to be afraid every day that you will be killed. There were thoughts about what was to come. Everything was very mixed, very mixed feelings. I participated in the war, where I saw hundreds of dead and wounded, and I consider myself entitled to connect my soldiers' life with the lives of soldiers of all armies, with those who are ready to sacrifice their lives for their motherland. They cannot be revered higher than they deserve. In Russia, they are respected. But we don't, on the contrary, they look askance at them. This is immoral, because the ability to give one's life for one's homeland has the highest moral value. 
If a soldier was ready to do this, then he cannot be morally humiliated for this later, which, unfortunately, is happening with us. We recently had a discussion among our comrades about whether it is worth laying flowers at the monument to Soviet soldiers. I would do it because I remember those poor soldiers who just had to fight a war and could not do otherwise. Of course, I am convinced that war is madness, it's understandable, especially if you've experienced it. But an individual soldier does not decide whether there will be a war or not. He can only defend his homeland, sometimes at the cost of his life. That's all for today. If you liked this video, then support it with a like and subscribe to the channel. Bye everyone, see you soon.